Hey everyone, today's video is more of a sort of unscripted rant or just like me kind of sharing some thoughts on stuff because one of the things I've noticed that I really really like seeing in my comment section is how when I did the photography video on Brooklyn Beckham last week and when I've done my poetry videos and other videos like that people always say that like they didn't realize they were kind of learning so much as the video went on and how you know it's kind of something I've always done and I've said this in a few interviews and stuff like that but I kind of feel like I try and grab people's attention with like a bit of a dramery sounding title and a bit of a like oh we're gonna get some gossip we're gonna get someone just like ranting about someone's bad work but then kind of segue into actual educational content without necessarily like realizing that if that makes sense I feel like a lot more people are gonna and a lot more people did click on a video about oh so-and-so's poetry is bad ha 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 rather than if I'd said here's an introduction to poetry which I have done before but when you present educational ideas in a way that people don't always realize they're learning in a way that captures their interest in something that they're already emotionally invested in and they can kind of like look at things and say hey I I know this person I can relate to them let's have a look at their work and then learn something along the way I think that's a really kind of important way of looking at things I also just think critique is a great tool for learning to critically analyze your own work as well in so many mediums so it doesn't matter if we're talking about poetry or writing or photography or art or music or sport or even academic writing if you want basically anything I think critique learning how to critique others work is a really really important skill to have because it means you can apply those same skills to your own work and make your own work better I think one of the kind of things that sort of taught me this was back when I was at university and I said this in my last video I was part of the photography society at Warwick and for a year I was their training manager which meant I ran the training sessions I was teaching people about photography and all sorts of things and before I became training manager, the two years before, we used to have, Kara's snoring in the background, um, we used to have this event called Comment and Critique, and it used to be a separate event. Basically, people would submit their own photographs, and then it was basically meant to be sort of a forum to get feedback, to give feedback, and that sort of thing, and it was an absolute failure. It just, it was so awful. Everyone felt really awkward, no one wanted to say anything bad about anyone else's work, it was always just like, oh I like the colours of this one, that's that's a pretty photo, because no one really knew how to critique each other, and no one wanted to offend each other, and sometimes there were things like, if it was like a, a photo of someone, like if there was a model in it, usually the model was in the room, because it was one of our friends from the photography society, so like you couldn't say, oh your model has one eye closed, like you should fix that because it looks weird without risking offending the model. You don't want to do that, like there were lots of things wrong with it. So basically we used to just have these really silent awkward rooms and for a while we did everything we could to fix it. We were trying different things, we were like okay well what if we split into smaller groups and have different exec members trying to like lead the discussion. Still awkward, still horrifically awkward. So when I became training manager I was like I am going to try something completely different here and each week we would do a training session on a different topic and then I would have this segment at the end which was kind of like comment and critique but I would search online for photographs on that topic. So one that really sticks in mind and this is one of the earliest ones I did and this is where I saw it click for people and I saw them really starting to have proper discussions and them actually learning stuff and it was amazing to see. So I started looking online for other people's photographs and then I would put them into a little slideshow presentation at the end of a training session and basically I would be like what do you guys think of this and I would try and lead the discussion in one way or another. So I would pick photos that either had something really Really obviously wrong with them or something that demonstrated a technique I'd spoken about in the training session really really well and I would kind of guide the discussion but I would mostly get other people to start trying to look for them so I would like show photos and be like what do you guys think of this what do you think maybe about the composition of it or do you remember what we were saying about shutter speed how have they used that here and it was kind of getting people to think about these things critically for themselves and the one that really stands out for me was during the wildlife photography and I'd done 
a whole little lecture on it and stuff and I told people you know like you want to use these settings you want to do this you want to maybe try doing these things blah, blah 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 you know it's like a whole thing and then at the end I went online and I found photographs and I put them on the slideshow and as I was going through them maybe the fourth or fifth one I came to was and if I can find these again online or something similar I'll put them on screen but I can't promise I'm gonna find the exact ones that I was using back then because it was about seven eight years ago something like that so I put up this photo on screen of two deer fighting. I don't know if they were like maybe elks or something. I, I'm, I'm terrible with naming animals. They were the ones with the horns and they were fighting and they, oh, stags maybe. And they had their horns like smashing together, their heads smashing together. Um, and it was quite an interesting shot, but the whole photo was a little bit bland. It was all just very kind of like dull and green. There wasn't much contrast. There wasn't much interesting lighting going on, but technically it was very competent. The deers were perfectly in focus. They timed it very well. They got an interesting subject. The photograph was very, very competent. And so I guided the conversation in that direction. People picked out all these great things about it. And I said to them, how would you improve this? And people were like, uh, and they had nothing. And then I switched the next slide. I was like, how about like this? And it was a photograph of nearly the same scene, two deers fighting. But instead, this one had been taken at the golden hour and they used this beautiful, beautiful technique. Um, so they'd got the sun shining through the trees and it all, all had this beautiful glowy haze to it. And it just, it looked like a beautiful painting or it looked like I, I don't know how to describe it other than it was stunning. The lighting on this was so perfect. You could see like moisture glistening off the back of these deer and the fight, he'd changed the angle up so the fight scene looked way more dynamic. It looked more like one deer was in control than the other. It was stunning. And when I showed those two photos in comparison, one good one and one excellent one, people were suddenly like, oh, and I could see them, like I could see it ticking over in their heads. And then I was like, okay, now we're gonna go and directly compare these two. What is it that makes this photo good, but this photo perfect? What's the difference and how has this photographer done this? And I started guiding the discussion that way and getting them to pick out all the little details. And I was like, okay, this lighting, how do you think he's done this? And then people were telling me like, oh, well, if I want to do that, I'd probably try and use these camera settings and these camera settings and so on. So I was getting people to be really, really critical of other people's work on a really detailed level so that they could then go and apply that to their own work. And then to kind of combine with that training session for the weekend after, we organized a social which was a trip to a local little sort of safari park and zoo. Well, not really a zoo, it was like a, a wildlife sanctuary. And we went and we saw tons of animals and we took photos of them and I was there so people could like ask me questions and I'd give them advice and stuff. And so it was like, you know, like I was there taking photos as well and people were like, oh, I'm having trouble like capturing this the way I want to. And I'd go over and help them and be like, oh, well, you know, maybe try using this setting. Hey, maybe change your camera in this way. And the other exec were there to do that for people as well. And it ended up being this amazing day and everyone had so much fun and it was like I wasn't just lecturing them saying use this use this use this because we added that comment and critique element people could see it in practice they were seeing examples before them and because I was using strangers work they didn't feel so bad about being harsher at times about being quite critical about really picking it apart because there wasn't anyone in the room who was gonna get insulted you know and that's why I think I guess my approach and my way of critiquing work online in terms of poetry, writing, and now photography and so on. I think it's very important to do because it helps others develop these critical thinking skills when they see me doing it. But I do find it's harder online because there's always a chance that the person's work you're talking about is gonna see it. And this is why I try and pick people who are much, much bigger than me to kind of pull their work apart. You know, people like Lele Pons, people like Trisha Paytas, people like Brooklyn Beckham, they're never gonna see my videos, so they're never gonna be personally offended by it. So I feel like I can be more honest and hopefully more helpful in my critiques. Obviously, sometimes this backfires with a certain YouTuber who gets angry, but I think that's the exception. So I also saw in my comments people saying like, oh, would you consider doing this kind of video like I did with Brooklyn Beckham? would you consider doing this for Instagram accounts and stuff? And on the one hand, if it was like a big, huge Instagram account, maybe. But on the whole, I don't think I'd just go to a random person's Instagram account and start picking apart their photos because that seems incredibly unfair if it's just a random person off the street. Because Instagram isn't a place where you're selling work. People aren't paying to consume your media. So the kind of, I guess, sort of our right to review it isn't quite the same, you know? 
if I buy a book, like I bought Brooklyn Beckham's book, I'm a consumer, I've paid for this, you're putting this out there as paid work and you can review it. Whereas if someone's just putting stuff on Instagram for fun and I come along and I'm like, your photo's crap here, oh this is really bad, why are you doing this, oh this is so awful, like it's just being petty and mean for the sake of it. These people didn't ask anyone to critique their work, they didn't ask anyone to review their work, no one paid for their work, they didn't ask for feedback. Who am I to come along and tell them if their photography is any good when it's for fun? And again, I saw another comment where someone said they were kind of like embarrassed now by some of their like, I literally saw this comment this morning, and um, it was this, this girl who said like, oh I'm just gonna like hide away all the Polaroids I've taken on my year out with um, wonky horizons now and I was like no 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 please please don't you know you're not a professional photographer you're not charging people for this work these polaroids these photos they're your memories they're for fun they don't have to be perfect the art and beauty in work like that that you're taking for fun is that it's your memories you're capturing a special moment and in those cases it doesn't matter that the horizon's a little bit wonky, you know? If you want to become a good photographer, then yeah, maybe that's something you can think about in the future. But for now, even with the wonky horizons, even with the overexposure she said she had, it doesn't matter. You're still capturing a memory, you're still capturing some fun, and it's something special for you to look back on and feel proud of and have these happy memories about. So, you know, <sighs> As much as critique can be helpful and educational, we also have to be mindful about who we're critiquing and why, or rather whose work we're critiquing and why. I have Polaroid photos as well that aren't technically perfect at all. There's, um, so some of my favourite ones are actually uh, for Kieran's birthday. He said he hadn't really done anything special for his birthday before, so I arranged this whole like day trip for him out in York, because again, he'd never been to York, and I was like, you're gonna love it. So I took him and we went out for a really nice lunch, at this little vegetarian place, because he's a vegetarian, and so I took him to a little vegetarian restaurant for lunch, and then we went to this beautiful little secondhand bookshop that I knew he was gonna love. We did a chocolate making workshop, we did an escape room that was Viking themed, which I knew we'd both love, and then in the evening we went to this like art deco style uh, little uh, restaurant with like jazz playing and the most amazing food and oh, such good wine and we just had the most wonderful lovely day. Oh and I took him to a little cocktail bar as well called Evil Eye that actually someone who I met through doing YouTube she recommended it to me and it's fantastic I love that place. So we also got these amazing cocktails in the middle of the day as well. Anyway not the point I'm going off topic here. This is what happens when I don't script. Point is, um, that day I took tons and tons and tons of Polaroid photos because I was like, these are going to be special memories and at the end of the day I split them between me and Kieran and some of them are just of him, some of them are just of me. We also did a walk around like some of the museum gardens as well and stuff. And anyway, the whole day I played around with a few kind of more experimental photos as well because I have this Polaroid camera that you can do double exposures on which is really really fun and I'm still getting the hang of it. I've had a couple of successes and a few times where it's just like, no, it's not very good. But I decided to play around with a couple of those that day and there's one that would have been really really good but I just have like, I basically I overexposed one of his eyes which is really frustrating so it's not a perfect photo but it doesn't matter because me and him were like having this wonderful day and these photos are amazing memories of the most amazing time we spent together and it was something creative and fun for us to play around with and do and those photos are for us and I love them just because they make me smile every time I look at them even though they're not perfect. So with things like that you have to remember why you're taking the photo and while it's always good to be critical of your work and be trying to improve when you want to, sometimes you also have to remember that hey I'm also doing this for fun and it's okay to not be perfect. I mean look at my paintings, I'm, I'm not a professional painter, I'm not good by most people's standards but I have a lot of fun with it and I really enjoy it and that's why I like to fill my house with my artwork and I've got it on all my walls and everything and I, I love it so much because it's about making me smile and it's the memories, you know? Whereas like if I was putting my stuff up in galleries then I would expect people to be a little bit harsher about it than they are now when I just post it on Instagram for fun and put it on my walls and occasionally sell prints to people who want it but I kind of think of it more of like merch than art if that makes sense. So yeah, there's that. So I guess going back to using it as an educational tool in the uh, context of my videos and stuff like that. I do think it is really important to show examples of both really good quality work and really bad quality work, which is why in all my poetry videos I try and contrast the work that I'm talking about. And some people say that's unfair, they're like, oh you can't compare a poet like 
certain YouTuber to someone like Caroline Duffy, who's, you know, been doing this longer and they're professional and she's poet laureate and stuff like that. It's unfair to compare them. And I'm like, but why? They're both charging money for their books. They both call themselves professional poets. Why? shouldn't I compare their work when it's going to be an educational tool? It's okay for me to sit here and say, this is what an extended metaphor is, and then say, this poem uses an extended metaphor, and then assume you've learnt it. You know, that's kind of what schools do. But if I can show you an example from a YouTube personality you know, rather than a poet you've maybe never heard of. But if I can show you some work and say, hey, this is what an extended metaphor is, here's an example of someone who's tried to use it but it's not quite worked for these reasons. And here's an example of a person who has used it, you know, maybe for a similar theme or topic or with a similar purpose, but it has worked. And you can directly compare the two works and you're emotionally invested in one of them already. And if you can directly compare them and say, oh, I see this now. Here's the tiny details where they've done this and they've done this and here's why they're different and here's why I prefer this and here's why I prefer this, and here's why I prefer this, and here's why I don't like this, and so on. And ultimately, it doesn't actually matter if you agree with my conclusions or not. And maybe you think this poet's amazing and this one's just a little bit bland, and that's okay too, that's absolutely fine. The point is, what I'm trying to do with my videos and what I want you all to do when you watch them is I want you to be able to look at the little details, see the little differences, start, start to understand that it's not just good to use this technique, it's how you use it, in what context, what else is going on in it, what are all the little details that make it good, and compare that to something that maybe hasn't worked, or maybe it has, and understand the differences, the nuances, the details. This is a really, really important thing to understand about humans, is that we like to contextualize. We don't always understand the inherent value of something until we can contextualize it. So Dan O'Reilly spoke about this in his book, Predictably Irrational, which is basically about like behavioral economics, and this this is all off the top of my head now. I read this book for the first time about 10 years ago, I want to say, so excuse me if I'm getting some of these details wrong. Please correct me if you know better. But basically, he talks about how it's really important when we're pricing items to contextualize the price so people know if they're getting a good deal or not. And he goes on to say how we can kind of manipulate this as well in marketing to make people want to buy one item over another. So for example, if I said to you, hey, I, sorry, it's the closest thing. I have this remote control for sale and it is five pound. Do you wanna buy it? Maybe you don't know if you wanna buy it or not because this is five pound a good deal for this. What are the features? What prices are other remote controls going for? Is there a remote control with more features for less money, in which case this is terrible value? Or are all of the remote controls, regardless of features, three times the price? In which case this is fantastic value and you should buy it straight away. We need context. So one of the examples he used, and again, this is quite old now. I'm not sure if they're still doing this, so this might be an out of date example. But one thing he used was the Wall Street Journal example. And this is always stuck in my head. Basically, they wanted people to obviously spend more money. So they initially had two options. They had, and I'm probably making up the figures now, but it was roughly something like this. They had, say, a year's subscription to the print magazine, newspaper, whatever you want to call it. But they had a year's subscription to the print issue for, let's say, $100. And they had the digital only, the web only version for $20. And everyone was like, oh, okay contextualizing, we're getting similar content, but print, web, this one's a lot cheaper, we'll go with that. And so everyone was buying the $20 option and they were like, oh, kind of, we kind of want people to go for the more expensive one, don't we? So they introduced a third option, a print and web option, and they priced that at $100, exactly the same as the print only version. Now, when you contextualize those prices, the print and web seems fantastic value because, oh my God, you're getting $120 worth of value for just $100. Like suddenly that seems like a really, really good deal. And more and more people started going for that option because of the context. Now this might sound like a weird thing to compare economics and marketing and, <laughs> you know, basically behavioral economics to arts. But it's true. Just seeing one poem out of nowhere and being told this is a metaphor and this is good, how do you know it's good? You can't just know it's good because I'm telling you. Sometimes we need to contextualize things. If I can contextualize what I'm teaching, if I can give you two poems and one of them just kind of makes you feel a bit, eh, okay, that's a poem. But the other one, makes you feel like, oh my god, I get this, I understand this, I'm having all these feelings and emotions and it's reminding me of this and this. If I can show you that and 
you understand the two different reactions. And then I break it down and say, and that's because this uses this and this uses this. I'm suddenly contextualizing the techniques that I'm teaching. And that makes it a lot easier to understand, a lot easier to remember, and a lot easier for you to go out into the world and look at different work and say, oh, well, I love this because it's doing this technique and I can see this here and this reminds me of this poem now. And, oh, I read another poem that tried to do this, but not as well. Or I read another poem that did this, but better. And suddenly you start contextualizing, you start critically analyzing the work that you're taking in and you have this whole new appreciation for it. And then you can go out and apply those same techniques to your own work if you want to. And that's why I think critique is such a powerful educational tool and one that so many people do overlook. There are also examples on my channel where I kind of wish I'd done this more, but didn't necessarily have the examples to hand at the time. So one example would be in the Harrow Fair series I just put out, I was saying it romanticizes abuse, it's bad because of this, 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 and so on. Um, and a few people asked me in the comments, they said, oh, do you have any examples of books that show abusive relationships, but like they represent it in the right way? in a way that doesn't romanticize it. And at the time I'd like, I kind of vaguely gave the example of Lolita, but that's a tough one because some people still romanticize Lolita and that's a whole problem in its own right. And probably a whole video I could do on that book. But I think now, one of the examples I would give as a, as a comparison and to contextualize what I was saying is probably, and in a similar vein, My Dark Vanessa. So I just read this and was absolutely blown away. I finished the whole 300 and odd page book in less than 24 hours. I just, I was blown away by it. Basically, it flips forward between present day and the past when the main narrator was a teenager and she was essentially groomed and abused and started a relationship with her teacher in school. And um, she was just 16 at the time, I think, maybe 15, something like that. And he groomed her and they had this whole relationship that went on pretty much to the present day in some ways, but it was very abusive. And then he got accused of grooming and assaulting other girls. But Vanessa, who was the first, she was adamant that what happened to her was different. It wasn't abuse, it was love, it was real. They had this special connection that no one else had. And all these other girls, they were lying, they were making it up. And even though the narrator in the book was saying, yeah, no, him having sex with me at 15, it was, it was love, it was real, it wasn't abuse. Even though she's saying that, even though looking back, she's romanticizing the relationship, it's very clear that the author isn't. And throughout the book, especially in the modern day bits, we see Vanessa come to realize, hey, what happened to me wasn't actually okay. It's, it's a very slow awakening for her where she realizes, damn, okay, this was grooming. Damn, he did do this to other girls. I wasn't special. I have been manipulated my whole life. This man is bad. And so you see that the narrator's perspective and the author's perspective are very different. The author isn't condoning anything that happened to this teenager. She isn't condoning any of the abuse. She's not siding with this teacher and saying, yeah, he's a great man. Oh God, isn't this a wonderful love story? It's very clear that the author is condemning what happened, condemning actions like that, but saying, hey, we still need to understand how the victims feel and how they view this and what their experience is. And I think that's an excellent portrayal of it. And even though Harrow Fair doesn't deal with any underage characters, it's just domestic violence, emotional abuse, all that sort of thing. Even though it's different to child abuse, both are still unhealthy relationships, but one is portrayed in a way that I think is dangerous to the audience. And one is portrayed in a way that I think helps the audience understand what that experience is really like. So again, I kind of wish in those videos I'd read that book at the time to be able to compare and contrast in that way, but that's why I'm mentioning it now. I think you can get something out of it. But anyway, these I think are the main talking points I wanted to go through in this video. Like I say, this is completely unscripted. It's off the top of my head. I just want to have a chat with you guys about this stuff because it's something I've been thinking about and I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Are there any things I missed out in this video? How do you feel about me drawing the line at kind of only critiquing work that is of, of like famous people or people above me or people who are trying to like charge for the work and stuff like that, you know, people selling their work, or do you think it should be kind of open critique where I could open up Instagram and critique anything I see? I don't know, where, where do you think we should stand on that? Do I have a responsibility to kind of vet who I critique or should it just be a free-for-all? Um, I've also had some people suggest that maybe I could critique my followers and viewers photography and I'm open to doing that if you wanted. I did do it a little bit with, uh, with poetry for a while, but that was so, so time consuming and I got so many submissions it was impossible to keep on top of them all. And honestly, those videos weren't getting the views. So it sounds horrible, but 
I wasn't making enough money from it to justify the ridiculous amount of hours I was spending on it. Whereas photography, it's gonna be a lot quicker to actually look at those photos and analyze them and talk about them in a video. So if that's something you'd like to do, then I'm very open to you guys sending me some photos for critique. It will be done in a public video rather than private, but if you wanna send me one or two of your photos, you can either go do that over on Instagram, send me a DM over there, or you can email it to me um, at the email address racheloates11 at gmail.com. So that's R-A-C-H-E-L-O-A-T-E-S 11. And that is also like in my channel description as well if you wanna find that out. So you can send it me over there and I'll try and make a video on that. I promise to try and be constructive in my critiques. So point out what I think is good, where I think you could improve, what little errors you might have made. I'm gonna try and be as helpful as possible. So if, you know, you wanna get better at photography, you want a critique, I'm, I'm open to doing that. Yeah, for now, this is where I'm gonna end this video. Thank you for listening to me rant today. I appreciate you guys a lot and I'll see you again very, very soon. Thank you.